All right, we'll turn it on over. All right, I'm very happy to introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight. Eric North is a, uh, a student of trees, and he has been for many years. He started out in a completely different field, uh, some IT field, right? Computer science. In computer science. Um, and so he, uh, he graduated and then actually got to move up to trees. Um, so Eric has taught our staff at Meyer Tree and Lawn for a number of years, probably three or four years now. Um, and coming in, he has just a very practical way of explaining, explaining things. A few years ago, um, I had this idea and, and bounced it off Eric. I said, what if I got some questions from a bunch of first graders about, about questions they might have about trees? And would you be willing to answer them with physiological answers and give us a, the complex answers to simple questions? And we usually go the other way around with these things. And so some of these questions came out like, uh, why do trees turn red? How do trees grow tall? Different things like that. But Eric had a, just a brilliant way of explaining it to our staff that helped us understand how to take care of trees better. And now today, Eric is going to take it from here and talk about what you talk about. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Jay said, this kind of this idea, this concept came out of the questions that kids ask about trees, and they often seem really simple. And then when we go to think about how to, how to actually answer them as scientists or as tree care experts, we actually realize that many of the uh, answers to these simple questions can be a lot more complicated, and it's difficult to sort of narrow them down into really simple terms. So, um, yep, so this little guy here, this is my friend Sai. He, um, we're training him to be, this is a, a, a son of a friend of ours, he, we're training him to be the next generation of tree lover. So, you know, I was thinking about Sai as I was coming up with some of these questions, and one of the first questions I thought that he might ask is, what is a tree, right? If he had never really, if I hadn't been sort of showing him trees and growing him trees since more or less the day he was born, he might ask this question, what is a tree? And it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. When I say tree, I bet everybody in here kind of got a picture in their brain about something. Maybe it's your favorite tree, maybe it's a tree in your yard, tree from your childhood, right? But you all had some idea of what a tree is. So as scientists, we oftentimes put, put together a definition of what a tree is, and it's, it's usually something like, oh, it's got to be long-lived, it's got to be some tall or something, and so we're going to kind of look at each one of those. So. Long-lived, right? Trees need to be long-lived, or the organism needs to be long-lived in order to be considered a tree. So here we've got, uh, this is my wife right here. She's standing by these uh, western cedars, Thuya placata. This is out in Vancouver. These were estimated to be around six to 700 years old. Uh, so that's pretty long-lived. I would agree with that. That seems, that's long to me, um, if, if only. Uh, next to them, we've got the giant, giant redwood here. So Sequoia dendron giganteum. And these can live to uh, hundreds to potentially thousands of years, right? So again, that's pretty long lived if you think about it. Um, then we've got the Bristol cone pine. If you've never heard of this, this is, it's, an, it's, a, it's a species that's native here to the US, really to the mountains in the west, sort of uh, Bryce Canyon area, Utah. And these species, in fact, this, this particular species has the oldest living tree, it's still alive today, or at least it was yesterday when I checked. Um, it is estimated to be around 4,800 plus years old. All right, still alive. That's an amazing, right? So this tree obviously fits that category of long lived, right? 4,000 plus years, almost 5,000 years. That's a tremendous amount of time, right? Then we've got the box elder, right? Everybody's favorite, the box elder. Uh, if you're Canadian, you might know this as Manitoba maple, uh, but the box elder is estimated to live on average somewhere between 60 and if it's really lucky, maybe it hits 100 years, right? But 60 years, I don't, I don't know about you, 60 years does not seem that long lived. I sure hope to make it past 60. Um, and even 100 years, right? The oldest known human so far has been 120 something years old. So even within a human lifespan, the box elder is not particularly long lived. Right, but we still recognize it as a tree. So maybe there's something else that lets us know that this is a tree. 
So one of the things that I want to stop and, and just kind of, because I think this is really fascinating, this science of dendrochronology, this is how we actually know how old things are and how events that happened before we were here happened. It's the art of dendrochronology or the science of dendrochronology. And it was developed in the early 1900s by this gentleman, um, A.E. Douglas. A.E. Douglas was really an astronomer and he wanted to take uh, tree rings and see if he could figure out solar cycles and, and sunspot cycles, really. And so he used tree rings to actually look at solar cycles throughout the course of history, and he was fairly successful at it. Tree rings grow basically, uh, they grow and change in different widths based on environmental inputs. So you might imagine a really wet year would be a really wide ring, and a really Dry year might be a really narrow ring, or if it's a shorter growing season or a longer growing season, right? So this field is called dendrochronology. I actually do this with urban trees. So I take a core sample of individual trees and look at them and try to de uh, determine what affects the tree's ability to grow in our urban environments so that we can maybe plan and make um, uh, better sites for our trees, right? And then this is just some other guy. I don't know. He came with the picture. I thought he was sort of interesting looking. Um, so, right, trees then, so long-lived, right? So, so we know now that trees need to be long-lived. We kind of have some idea of how we might determine how long-lived a tree is. And then we also consider that trees need to be tall, right? So you think about tree, none of, most of you are probably thinking about something that's a little tall, maybe here in Minnesota, it's oaks and maples, cottonwoods, uh, white pines, things like that. This is again the uh, giant sequoia, right? Obviously quite tall. Um, so tall or tallish, right? This right here, the, um, this, this little tree here, this is only about six or seven feet tall, but it's actually a uh, white spruce. So this particular tree is estimated to be over uh, 9,000 years old. Now, most dendrochronologists, I just told you the oldest tree was around 4,800 years old, right? Most dendrochronologists don't count this particular tree because the above ground portion, this little trunk thing here, has only been growing since 1940, All right? So this is in Sweden, still alive. I believe they estimate the age to be around 9,550 years old. And really what happened is this white spruce, so we have white spruce here, right? We've all seen them in yards and, and forests and things like that. Much taller than this. Don't usually look a little better than this particular one, but this bottom part is actually part of that tree. And what had happened is the climate in Sweden, just the growing seasons are so short, it never really sprouted up until around the 1940s, Sweden started getting a little bit warmer and the growing season became long enough that the top part of it could form an actual trunk, something we might recognize as a tree, right? So we think about the white spruce and we certainly all recognize that as a tree, but in this particular case, all it had for, till the 1940s was actually for, you know, 9,000 years, was just this tiny little shrub-like portion, right? But still we think of this as a tree. So single stemmed, mostly you hear foresters talk about this, that, so you can have trees that are one stem or two stems, right? So mostly we think about trees, if, if you have a shrub, like you've got some dogwoods or lilacs, those have multiple stems all over, we don't consider that a tree. It might, they might get kind of tall, but there's all sorts of little stems in there, right? So we think single stems. And most people look at this picture, and these are all quaking aspens, and they think, oh, these are all, I see the individual single stems. Well, this is a particular special grove of quaking aspen. These are all one organism. So every single stem in here is actually connected to every other stem below the root, uh, below ground via the root system. This uh, particular one is named. It's um, Pando is the name of this. Uh, and it's estimated to be, I believe, somewhere around 80,000 years old, this entire clonal mass. Okay. So quoted as being at least the largest tree in the world in terms of total mass and uh, wood production and things like that. Um, the, it's also one of the larger, largest organisms, although I think it competes with the fungus that, that's growing in Portland, right? But both extremely large in terms of the amount of area and mass that they cover. This is in South Central Utah. So you can actually go see this. Uh, a few years ago, it was under a lot of stress and pressure from sort of warming and drought conditions in that area. So they were kind of looking at what they could do to help that. But this is not single stemmed, right? This, the one tree, so if you genetically tested each of these trunks, they're identical to every other one. And then the, all their root systems are connected. 
right? So single stem, so kind of difficult. Most of you maybe have seen river birch or you've seen the three stem trees. You can buy them at nurseries and you see them in people's yards, right? We still recognize those as trees. So single stems, right, maybe not, not that important depending upon how many stems you're talking about, right? Uh, diameter growth. This one is probably, I consider, one of the most important things. So diameter growth, basically how, how much uh, is it putting on year over year? So we plant a tree, it's really tiny, right? It's only a couple of inches, and then it grows in diameter year over year, right? So this, again, is this uh, giant sequoia. So these are the, the largest trees in terms of diameter that we have uh, on the planet right now. And you can see this, this gentleman right here. Um, I was standing in line actually to take my picture with the tree, so uh, it was a long line. So I just snapped a picture of this guy, but you got to get a relation of how large uh, the tree is compared to this guy, right? So diameter growth is really important. Things that don't put on diameter growth, if we think about tomatoes, right, your tomato plant, really it kind of grows a stem, kind of gets to a certain size, and then it just grows a bunch more stems, put on some fruit, right? So that obviously doesn't classify. There's no diameter growth there. And there are a few other species and plants that we think about in that particular way. Wood, right, trees have to, if you're a tree, you have to produce wood, right? So here we have what looks like a picture of some bark, uh, but it's actually the side of a palm tree. Palm trees, if you didn't know, even though tree is in the name, seems like a no-brainer, right? That's obviously a tree. A tree is in the name. Uh, it's actually a grass. It's a monocot. Yeah, crazy, right? If you had grass like this, much harder to mow. Um, and palm trees do not necessarily put on wood the way we traditionally think about wood. They don't typically, most species of palm do not put on a diameter growth. So if you planted this palm tree, uh, once it reaches a certain size and the fronds fall off, it stops really growing at that particular point, and it's only growing from the very top. In fact, has anybody ever seen palm hearts that in, in this grocery store? You get a little can of it. Yeah, so a palm died to make that can. So if, if you care about uh, the lives of palms, you don't want to buy palm hearts, right? The, the basically, it's taken from the, they have one bud, and it's at the very, very top. So right up here, right there, there's one bud. It's usually uh, the palms have this, the largest bud of anything in sort of the, uh, the plant kingdom, and once you harvest that, that's it, the tree dies, okay? Or the, the grass, really, this giant grass dies, right? But we still kind of think of these as trees, right? We still think of them, and we still sort of treat them. Uh, if you were to work in an area where there are lots of palms and you were an arborist, you would sort of manage these like you would trees, right? They go plant them, they prune them, things like that. But it doesn't actually produce wood in the same way. In fact, if you cut a palm, or I've walked by palms that have been cut down, normally if you cut a tree down here, you can actually count the rings. You can kind of see them. Palms have no rings whatsoever. It's just tons of little, it looks like little drinking straws actually in there. And there's no rings at all, so it's just a uh, single surface. So, conclusion. Uh, you you kind of just know it when you see it, right? You know a tree when you see it. I think the Supreme Court has used this definition for various things. So. Trees, you, you know it when you see it, and if you manage it like a tree, it's probably a tree, right? But I think some important things to consider is that it has to attain some sort of height, right? Just low lying on the ground, we probably don't really consider it a tree, unless the species is capable of growing to some height, like we looked at with the white spruce, right? And then it has to produce some sort of annual growth or growth in diameter that kind of increases through time, right? So those are kind of the important things to think about when considering what actually a tree is. Okay. So how tall can trees grow? This is a question we get a lot. How to, well, actually, how tall do you think that tree is is, is the, the first question. And then how tall can that tree get or how tall will that tree get? Right? So I thought this was kind of interesting. What limits the height of tree growth? So the, currently, the largest tree that we are aware of and has been measured is 379.3 feet. So when I looked at this a few years ago, it was 379.1 feet. So either there was a measurement error or it's actually continuing to grow. And the current estimates are they believe this tree is actually still growing in height. This is a redwood. This is the coastal redwood, which is a different species than the giant redwood. Um, and this one is named Hyperion. Its location is secret. Right? They don't tell people where it is. 
although apparently some engineering people figured it out on Google Maps where it is, so you might be able to find it, but they, they kind of don't want people to visit it a lot. If, you have, if you're a National Geographic fan, this is the tree that was put in the, kind of as the, like, the, the center fold out for the National Geographic, um, so a lot of tree people have this on their walls. Um, and, it, and my office mate has this. Um, so you can see these, very tall. The tallest one that is believed to have lived was actually Eucalyptus regions, which is native to Australia. And they are also a, one of the tallest growing trees that we have in the world. And the tallest one, this is still the tallest current one that's, that's known, that's actually living and still growing. Uh, the tallest tree that has been estimated, they believe it was around 520 feet tall. And what they did is they, they found this eucalyptus region. It had fallen, and the top of it had broken off. So they measured from the base to where it had fallen, and they measured 400-something feet, and then they estimated based on the size of the trunk where it had fallen, kind of the taper of how much more they thought was there. So unconfirmed, but estimated 500-ish feet, somewhere in that range. So quite tall, right? These are large, large organisms. So genetics obviously plays... Uh, quite a part in this. These are my two dogs. And regardless of how much I feed the little dog, he will never be as tall as the larger dog. So Darwin is the little dog, right? Bella is the larger dog. And uh, he, he acts like he's much bigger than he is, but he will never, it doesn't matter what we do, right? His genetics just limit his size. So genetics obviously plays quite a factor into it. Okay. Environmental conditions. Not only the environmental conditions of how much water do you get, but also what is your growing season? So there's been some estimates and some papers that have come out scientifically that have looked at trees in Minnesota and that their height has been increasing over the years. And you think, well, yeah, that seems obvious. If it's still alive, it should still be getting taller. Um, but they should be getting taller than they ever really have in the past, right? And so part of that has been the, the idea there is that our growing seasons have actually added a little bit of time on, on both the spring and the fall side. So our growing season here in Minnesota, at least in this part of Minnesota, has, has extended a bit, allowing the trees to basically continue to grow, so allowing them to put on height growth, a little bit more height growth year over year. And so in that way, we can kind of look back at historic records and look at the diameter to height relationships, and we can sort of see that, yeah, our, our trees are actually getting a little bit taller not nearly as tall as they do out west where they're growing season, like in Seattle, where they have plenty of moisture, obviously, and their growing season is much longer, but we're kind of getting uh, a little bit taller trees here in Minnesota than we likely have had in the past, okay? And uh, as you go further north, actually, temperature is the controlling factor for growth as opposed to moisture. So as you get into Canada where it's cold so much of the year and you've got like a three-day three, three day growing season kind of thing, right, the longer you can make that growing season, the more that impacts how, how much those trees can actually grow. Okay. So water movement, this is where it gets sort of complicated. Um, water movement turns out to be probably the thing that physiologically limits the height growth of trees. Okay? So initially there were some theories about how do trees actually move water? And if you stop and think about it, there's no... So when we pump a fluid in our bodies, right, we have a heart that kind of it's a muscle and it actually is physically moving. Trees have no moving parts, right? They're basically just uh, standing there and letting things happen or so it seems. And so initially there, there was some thinking that, oh, it must be some sort of pressure from, from the ground is kind of pushing water up. Well, so a bunch of tests were done and turned out that that wasn't quite good enough. And then there was a theory called um, cohesion adhesion. So cohesion is the, the ability of water molecules to want to stick together and kind of pull each other along. So like when you boil a pot of water or something and it starts to steam, it doesn't all just instantly steam and fall out, right? This uh, energy has to build up and then a little bit goes and it, it never just see like one little dollop of steam, right? It's all connected. So it's kind of these lines of water molecules sort of chaining together. And so they thought, oh, it's, well, one must get started and then the water just kind of trickles up, like when you put your thumb on the end of a straw, right? Put in some water, thumb on the end of a straw or something like that. Or you stick a straw in the water and it kind of goes up a little bit further, right? That's cohesion adhesion. So with trees, the actual, the next kind of extension of that theory, and this is the sort of current theory that people believe is 
is the most accurate, is cohesion tension. So water still wants to be close to other water, but there's tension and pressure that builds up inside the xylem. We'll talk a little bit more about what xylem is later, but inside the actual xylem of the trees. And that creates a negative sort of pressure that builds up, which ends up, so if you've got water at the, at the base where it's coming out of the soil, gets into the root system, and you've got this negative uh, pressure above it, it actually sucks or sort of pulls water through the tree, right? So it's not being pushed from below, it's sort of being sucked or pulled from above from this negative pressure that exists, right? So nature always wants a balance, and inside the tree it's, it's trying to achieve a similar sort of balance, right? Trying to balance out that pressure, and in doing so it's actually moving water throughout the tree. So this actually depends upon things like um, this, if the soil needs to be moist and there needs to be this, this gradient of moisture as you go through the actual tree trunk, right? So if you look at, if you have less moisture at any one point um, below a system, water will actually flow in reverse, right? And the tree will start to wilt. Um, if that happens for too long, then the tree will die eventually. Okay. So water potential, right? This is, these are the formulas that we look at. And I said complex, so I had a lot of fun putting this formula together. I'm sure you're having a lot of fun looking at it. Um, formulas are, are neat. But basically what this is saying is this, this water potential, right, this, this kind of W over here, needs to be negative because it needs to be lower than it is below at each step of the way, right? And so some of the things that factor in are the osmotic, potential, that's, that's what's happening in the soil. The pressure potential actually needs to be sort of positive. And then the gravitational potential, right? So gravity is always wanting to pull the water back down. So we need to can, kind of factor all of those things into this particular formula. So we look at this in a total system and we call this the soil uh, plant atmosphere continuum, right? There's no one part that we can kind of take out of this entire equation. So the flow of water is what we're really interested in. And the flow of water, so the, this little symbol on top, that's the potential, right? The W is the water potential, and then the resistance is underneath. So the flow of water, basically the potential of that water to move up into the tree is, is some interaction between the amount of water in the soil and then the resistance of the soil to want to lose that or from any one part of the tree to resist the flow or movement of that water up through the tree. So one of the first things we look at is the resistance between the soil and the roots. So there's some water in your soil, right? So if you have a wet soil and you have a tree in it, that means the soil has likely got more moisture in it than the roots, so that's good. And the soil has to have less resistance than the roots. So if you think about resistance as um, how difficult it is to pull something out, right? So the wetter a soil is, uh, the less sort of resistance there is for that to move into a drier surface, right? If the soil is really dry, the resistance goes up and the roots will actually leak water into a soil. So this happens in really dry periods. Moisture will actually leave the root system of your tree, which is why we stress watering trees, especially newly planted trees, on sort of a regular basis, right? at least once a week if you're not getting rain, so that that soil remains moist, so you're not actually losing moisture from the tree into the soil. Okay? And then you've got the root system to the xylem. The xylem is the stuff in the trunk. That's what wood is made out of, basically, is, is xylem. And so the roots have some water. They don't necessarily want to get rid of that water. And so there's some resistance, right? Just as you, um, if, if water had no resistance at all, um, it would move through the system very, very quickly. So there's some resistance here to that water actually moving. The xylem then has to have less water potential and less resistance than the roots so that it can actually push the water, uh, or excuse me, get the, let the water be pulled through it as you go up. And then from the, the xylem into the leaf cells, so this is kind of going through into the top part of the canopy here. So the, the xylem itself has a certain amount of water in it, and that water has to be more than what's in the leaf. Otherwise, the leaf will contribute water back to the xylem, and it will flow in the opposite direction again. So the leaf is usually drier than what the actual xylem is. So the xylem is like a straw, kind of. You can think of it like that. It's full of water. If that ever becomes not full of water, the leaf will kind of go in reverse, and that's when you see leaves starting to wilt, right? So, um, and then once it gets into the leaf, these symbols change. You can see it changes from that um, into a C. So you've got the 
uh, concentration of leaf and air. So once you get into the leaf, the leaf actually is where all the water leaves the tree, or the, the bulk of the water actually leaves the tree. If the air is really, really humid, which it, even here in Minnesota, it typically doesn't get humid enough for this to happen, but it does on occasion when the air is very, very humid, the leaf actually has um, less moisture than the air, and so it can't lose moisture into the air. For those of you who are runners, right, if you run on a hot, humid day, or you're exercising on a hot, humid day, and you sweat, and the sweat just kind of stays on your skin because it's really too humid for that to evaporate very efficiently, the leaf is doing the same thing. Right, so the more humid it is, the less moisture the tree can move through. This is actually kind of bad for the tree because it starts to shut down. Right? Photosynthesis can't work without that. So uh, that's basically now how water moves through the entire tree. So we talked about soils a little bit. I mentioned soils. So this is um, really, really basic soils. Um, soils are usually made up, there's rarely pure sand, pure loam, or pure clay, right? It's usually some combination of these and we measure these particles. But if you look at it, the sandier a soil is, the water runs almost straight through it, okay? So you see on this picture here, that doesn't balloon out very much. The water coming out of the hose just kind of goes and, and kind of runs right through. Those of you who have sandy soil or have lived in places with sandy soil know that if you try to water anything, you're constantly watering things because it just runs right through. Loams, if you read plant books and plant material, they usually say some sort of well-drained loamy soil, right? That's kind of the ideal spot. And it sort of gets there and it kind of bubbles out a little bit and then sort of nicely drains through. Clay is the stuff that basically gets into the soil and then sort of hits and it actually needs to go horizontal before it'll start to, to filter back down again, which is why if you have a really clay soil, you'll see that a little bit of watering goes a long way, right? And you'll get pooling in, uh, in your soil near the roots of the tree. So when trees are growing in these different, different spaces, they actually need or prefer a couple of things. And one, a couple of the things that they really need are moisture, obviously, and they also need enough air. So if roots don't have enough air, they don't grow particularly well, and they can't absorb this out. So uh, really heavy clay soils tend to have not enough air, so they don't hold, or they don't hold enough air for the tree to actually be able to absorb water. Okay. So roots and osmosis. So basically, to get water in, so we're kind of in the soil. The soil's got enough water to get water into the to the roots. It actually is the process of osmosis, where it sort of diffuses from the soil into the root system, and the roots act a little bit as a filter. They pick up some of the nutrients they want, but they filter out the things that they don't necessarily need. So they don't have sand inside the roots, for instance. They get the water in, and that osmotic potential actually builds up some pressure and it does lift the water a little bit to get the whole system kind of going. I actually put this slide in mostly because I love this picture. Um, I think I don't draw well and anybody that's ever seen me draw anything can attest to this. And so I thought this is a really uh, beautiful picture and then I looked closer and I realized that this is a, a terrible picture. It's buried at least three or four feet too deep. So this first root over here, you'd really want kind of at the surface. And then I looked at where I got this image from, and it's from arbor wood uh, caring for tree roots. And I just thought that was kind of funny um, that they would draw a picture with the tree roots buried at least three or four feet too deep. But it's a very nice kind of picture to illustrate. So once you get into the root system, right, the tree has absorbed the water now and it's got to get into the trunk itself, you have these vessels. So this is an actual photograph of honey locust, okay, honey locust tree vessels. I took a core sample, which is essentially about a number two pencil size piece of wood that you extract. So it doesn't kill the tree, doesn't really even hurt the tree very much. Um, you extract it out and then I sand off the surface so I can count the rings and measure the rings. And one of the things that we're looking at here are the actual ring width and you can see the individual vessels themselves. So the little white dots in there, those are actually, normally they would be wide open but when you sand them a little sand dust basically gets in there and so they turn white from the sawdust essentially. But that's the vessel of the actual where the water is actually moving. In this particular image, you can see two full rings. So you can see a ring here, right here is one ring. That little gray dot is just a dot I marked. And then this is another ring here. And those are the two full rings. And then this ring, you can't see the full ring there. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, and, and I'll have, I have a few more pictures of this when we look at 
um, how these rings actually form. So water movement, most people think, oh, water goes into the tree, moves straight up the tree. Water movement actually moves more uh, kind of in a spiral shape. Okay? And here you can see it. This is a Norway maple. Um, and you see this, this rib here where it's actually kind of moving in that sort of diagonal shape. This is likely a good indicator of how the water actually flows in the tree. So you rarely see these, not always, but you do see them in a, in a line occasionally, but a lot of times these frost ribs will be in these kind of strange sort of diagonal patterns. And a lot of that is likely due to the fact that when trees move water, it doesn't just go straight up, it actually kind of goes and shifts over and over and over. There was a great research paper where they actually dyed some water, put some basically coloring into the water, and then they let the tree absorb it, then they cut the trees down and section them off so they could actually see these spiral movements through. And different species move water in different spiral patterns. In fact, different species use different amounts of rings, different number of annual rings to actually move water, and it's surprisingly small. For most of our hardwoods, like oaks, it uses only one to two years worth of rings to actually move water. So if you have a several hundred year old oak, it's really only using the outer two or, two or so rings to actually move water. All that inner stuff is there purely for structure, purely to help keep the tree standing upright. So rarely in a straight line, and that's why you see some of these defects the way that you do. In fact, if lightning hits, you can sometimes see it follow the water pattern as well, right, where the most amount of water might have been. Um, so how does it move, right? You, you think these are just kind of straws, big, long straws. Actually, these are little, uh, these in conifers, they're called tracheids. So, but you think of them kind of like straws or vessels. And in, in um, all of our hardwoods, they're actually called vessels. But in between those, those vessels and tracheids are actually connected. So they stand side by side, and then they stand on top of each other. And where they stand side by side, they're connected via pits. And those pits actually allow water to move horizontally and then up. This is why when you cut off a branch or you injure the trunk of a tree, it can actually shunt and move water around that and go back above it, which is why you don't see everything die directly above where you just wounded. If it only moved in a straight line, if you cut a tree in any one spot, everything above it would have to, would have to kind of die out without the ability to sort of move horizontally. So within the tree, whenever one of these vessels or tracheids becomes damaged, either from an external uh, thing that happens or internal disease or something like that, it'll actually plug these pits and sort of wall off so that the tree cannot move water through there. It doesn't try to, otherwise you just have kind of spurts of water going through, right? Or you'd have air bubbles form in this system and that would also be quite damaging. So whenever it detects that, it actually shunts these and moves water around whatever the damaged section is. And in order to actually get water through the entire system, it uses stomata. Stomata are on the underside of the leaf. So really, even though the roots sort of absorb this water and push it up, they only push it up a few feet. In order for that to get into the xylem and actually move through the entire tree, it has to use stomata, and that's entirely uh, done through the leaves, basically. On the underside of the leaves, these tiny, tiny, tiny little microscopic holes exist. And the tree moves almost all of its water out. 90 plus percent of the water that the tree absorbs is actually moved out of the tree via the leaves. So this is what helps to give us some of our evaporative cooling. So we talk about the benefits of trees and how, how wonderful they are. People think of cooling and they think shade, right? The tree provides shade and that's one of the things it does. But it also, just like when you sweat and your skin, as, as it evaporates, your skin actually cools down. When the tree is moving water and pushing it out of its stomata, the tree is actually cooling not only the leaf surface, but it's also cooling the entire environment as it's moving out and using energy to actually move that water and evaporate it. So it's, it's uh, creating a cooler environment for anywhere near a tree. So that's why part of the reason when you're hiking around through the forest, right, you can feel the extreme differences in heat. Some of that's the shade, some of that's that evaporative cooling that you're feeling. So some things that kind of, kind of play with this, uh, leaf shape, leaf resistance, right, these are some things. So um, the shapes and, and texture, you notice some leaves are thicker or waxier than others. So we've got a couple of things here that um, leaf size, shape, and arrangement, basically, they uh, play a lot into how 
how efficiently a, a, a tree might do this. You'll notice that some trees, if they have leaves that are really heavily shaded, those leaves are much larger. They're actually quite a bit thinner. They don't move water as efficiently as the ones in the sunlight that are even a little bit smaller, but they tend to be a little bit thicker, right? And wind speed. So the windier the day is, just like if you blow on, on water that you spilled on a hot day, it actually evaporates a bit cooler, right? Kind of makes sense. And leaf arrangement. So if you think about maples, they're oppositely arranged. So the leaves are directly opposite each other. And then if you look at the next pair up, they'll be rotated 90 degrees from each other. And so you can kind of see them or, or approximately 90 degrees as they sort of move. So those leaves are kind of shifting constantly to maximize solar activity and also to help move water through the system. So some issues that can happen if you have too much water in the system, right? This can actually limit how well and how tall a tree might grow. So this particular plant that I uh, have a photograph of here, this is red mangroves from down in Florida. They actually are kind of odd. And when we think about trees, they actually grow roots directly into the water and kind of prefer, and they live on these stilts, which you can see in the little inset picture there. They actually live in stilts like this. But most of the trees that we have here in Minnesota, if they sit in water for two uh, long of a period of time, they will actually go into a drought stress because they're missing the oxygen, right? So trees, roots need two things. They need water and oxygen. And if they're missing one of those two components, they don't do well. And most of the trees we have have not evolved any sort of capacity in order to, to allow them to have that uh, movement of water without the oxygen. So um, too much water is a bad thing, as it turns out, for trees, unless it's specially adapted to. So bald cypress, again, down in Florida, swamp species, right? Um, those do quite well. Uh, mangroves, even, even some that we have here that are more what we refer to as riparian trees, which are those that grow along riverways. So silver maple, the elms, things of that nature, they actually do okay with some annual inundation of water from spring floods but a lot of our other species do not tolerate much more than a, a day or so of flooding. So that's kind of how tall trees can be, right? So really limited by genetics, the environment, and then how it actually moves water. So one estimate of, of exactly uh, the, the upper limit of that, just from the theoretical stance, was something around 100 miles that a tree could potentially grow from just the physics of how the water movement happens, but obviously, uh, there are lots of other things in our environment that would limit that, right? So what are trees made of? So this is uh, our third question. So we're going to spend a lot of time on this particular one. Uh, so trees made of here, we see mostly they're made of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, uh, and then some other elements in here. And I put nitrogen down here because this is what, you know, when people buy fertilizers or they feed their trees. We'll talk a little bit about what feeding your tree is. Uh, nitrogen, really it's a pretty small component of the over. If you cut down a tree and you just measure the elements, this is kind of how they stack out on average. Now, individual species are going to differ and it's going to depend upon how well it was growing and things like that. But mostly it's carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, right? So that's kind of what they're built out of. Well, that's an, almost entirely what they're built out of. And then a few other minerals that you go through in the soil. So trunk growth, right? So I talked a little bit about how this happens, this thickening. So um, I'm going to kind of go and diagram this trunk for you real quick in, in very basic terms. So the pith, this is the very center. Nearly all plants that grow have a pith or a center growing point. So if you cut down a tree, it's that little tiny circle in the center. Or if you look at a branch or even a twig and you see that little tiny circle in the center, right? A lot of times by the time a tree gets to be large enough, the pith kind of gets crushed as it's putting on different layers of wood. But you can definitely see this pretty readily, especially in things like Kentucky coffee tree. It has a giant pink pith on the inside. It's kind of neat to cut a branch and look at that. If you look at black walnut, it's got something called a chambered pith which is sort of an interesting thing to look at. Okay, then we've got bark. I'm just going to assume everybody here knew that, um, but I thought I'd put it on there anyway. Uh, and then we've got phloem, right? So phloem is the part of the tree that actually moves the sugar. So it moves from the leaves down basically through the plant and into the root system. So that's the phloem. And then we've got the xylem. And the xylem is the heartwood and the sapwood. So if you've heard of that, um, the heartwood and the sapwood. And it's what actually forms the annual tree rings. So the, the rings that we count year over year are made up of xylem, okay, xylem cells. And then we've got, so taking kind of a little bit closer look at bark, 
right? This is a, a, a picture of basswood bark, and it's on its side here. So you'd be looking at, this would be the outer edge of the tree here, and this would be the inner side here where the rings are. So outer edge and then inner side here, okay? Um, and you're, the, the actual texture of the bark is quite a bit different. It's basically some specialized bark cells that are made of a lot of subrin and things like that um, to help reduce the potential of water loss through the bark, right? It wants to keep the water going through the tree into the leaves because that's important for photosynthesis, okay? So a uh, little warning here. Now I have a, a fully nude photograph, so if you don't want to see this, I'll explain why it's important. If you, you can look away. Um, so this is a uh, cork oak that has been basically stripped of all of its bark. If any of you are interested in wine and you, you like the old-fashioned wine corks, this is where it comes from, actually. This tree is one of the only trees that I am aware of that you can actually strip off all of the bark. And here's some gentlemen here doing it. So this is the actual bark. This orange stuff underneath is not the bark. It's this right here. And you can see they're kind of collecting mounds of it. And they, they peel it off, and that's where the cork from cork flooring comes from. That's where cork from wine bottles or any sort of cork. That's the primary source of it, okay? Or it's recycled from this source originally. They can harvest this. So it doesn't kill the tree. Most other trees, if you were to strip off all of its... Uh, bark, you would probably kill the tree. With this particular tree, um, it actually, you can harvest this about every seven or eight years. So it doesn't grow here, unfortunately. It's more of a Mediterranean species, but it does, uh, it is a very interesting product that you can get from the bark of trees. Now, this has a very, very high subrin content. That's the corky, squishy material, right? Where most of our trees here, it's in there, but they don't have quite, quite as much as this. So 90% of the growth, so water is very important. We just talked a lot about water. 90% of the growth is attributed to the amount of available soil moisture. So, and that's usually considered that annual growth. This is why we use this in science, the annual rings to help us inform information about how much did it rain in the past? How much is it raining now? What years were dry years? What years were wet years, right? And so we can look at this because those rings really are impacted quite steeply by the amount of water that's available in the soil, which traditionally would come from right, the rain. Uh, in urban areas, it's a little more complicated where we have the ability to water, artificially water trees. Okay. So this is, I, you know, I'm a scientist, so I like to look at cellular pictures of things. And so this is a cellular cut of a piece of wood, right? Really, really thin slice. It's not typically blue. They stain it that way to, to help, uh, help highlight some of the things, some of the different components. But this, um, this right here, this is called cambium. So cambium, a lot of you have probably heard of cambium. Cambium is this actively dividing. It's about one to two cell layers thick, and it's actively dividing both to the inside of the tree and to the outside of the tree. And so think of this. We had this tree where the trunk is 4,800 plus years old. That cambium has been actively dividing, these two little cell layers actively dividing this way for 4,800 plus years. Right? That's quite an amazing feat for two little cells to just kind of keep two, two cell layers, two, three cell layers thick to just keep dividing in and out. To the inside, or to the outside, excuse me, they create phloem, and that's this little kind of open spot here. You can see right, right where that's by. That's phloem. Okay? That phloem actually gets crushed over time, becomes part of the bark, and then a lot of the bark sloughs off of the tree. So you kind of, kind of like you slough off skin cells, the, the bark sloughs off through time. You don't typically notice it. Right? And then to the inside, we've got xylem. And from this particular image, you can tell that this is a conifer. We're looking at a conifer. I can tell that we're looking at a conifer. Um, hopefully, you will be able to tell that in a few minutes. Um, and I'll show you what the differences are because conifers look a lot different than do hardwoods in terms of their cellular structure and in terms of the way their xylem are actually arranged. So people can diagnose what trees they're looking at from just little chunks of wood. Okay. Another portion of what's in the wood are what are called parenchymal rays. So what we're looking at here is a really, really close-up picture of uh, xylem, and the big bubbles are the, those big sort of open spaces. Sometimes there's two together, sometimes just single there. Those are the actual vessels. So that's the part that would be trans transferring water. Uh, some of these other features that we're looking at are either smaller little vessels or they're uh, fibers that are kind of running through, and some of them might actually be tracheids. 
But the parenchymal rays, those run across the ring boundaries. And on oaks, you can see this. If you've ever cut a slab of oak, you see all those kind of white lines kind of going in toward the center of the tree. The parenchymal rays are where the tree stores food. Right? It's a food store area. And it's also how it translocates stuff from the, the newly forming phloem and, and xylem, and it kind of can move it into the inside. It's also where the tree dumps a bunch of its metabolic waste. So as it's done doing things, it kind of goes to the inside. And in some trees, like our oaks, it fills them up with tannins and things like that that help make the heartwood uh, a different color. It helps make, in some species like uh, honey locust, it makes them very decay resistant. So they resist decay partly because of those compounds that get shifted to the inside of the tree. So even though it's not biologically doing anything, it's just mechanical in strength, it does actually um, serve a place for the tree to, to dump some of its waste products. So gymnosperm. So here we see it, this right here, this kind of darker line. This is uh, the edge of a ring, right, the edge of one year of growth. And this is the beginning of, of the new growth. So we only have this kind of one partial ring here. This dark line is, this, is the uh, summer, is the end of the summer or the fall, right? That's where the vessels get, or the tracheids get smaller and smaller and smaller, and their size of the cells get thicker and thicker and thicker, the, the size of the cells, and so that's what gives it that darkening color. Now, if you look at these, each little kind of opening or little circle that you see kind of looks like an ear of corn going across. Each one of those is a tracheid, and they're stacked right next to each other. So one right next to the other, right next to the other. And this is how conifers actually sort of uh, can remain upright, basically. They don't contain very much in terms of fibers. So they use all these tracheids, the things that are moving water, to actually create their strength. Okay? And then if we look at a ring porous species, um, which this particular one is black ash, you'll notice the, the white little dots here, those are the vessels. So those big white dots are vessels, and then you see those tiny, tiny little white dots in amongst the little sort of brown area. The brown area is all fibers. That's what's giving this tree its strength. And the vessels are used primarily just for water movement, not as much for strength. And you'll notice that the vessel size in the ring porous is quite a bit larger. These are all about the same magnification. So they're quite a bit larger than what you see in the gymnosperm. Okay? Gymnosperm, sorry, is a conifer. Um, yeah, gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms are the older evolutionary lineage of plants. And then here, this next one, is diffuse porous. And you'll notice that its structure is different. There's these little white dots all over, but they don't really seem to have much of a pattern to them, right? They're just sort of randomly. And this one is a maple, actually. So you'll see those little tiny white dots, much, much smaller than what you can see from the uh, black ash, right? So they move water not as quickly as the ring porous species, right? There's a lot more of them, and they're kind of spread evenly or diffusely throughout that particular ring, but they don't move water quite as efficiently. So to give you some sense, right, these are all taken under a microscope. It's hard to get a sense of scale. So to give you some idea about this, I took a picture with my pencil lead, which was 0.3 millimeter, if you don't think in metric. Um, um, there's 25, roughly 25 millimeters to an inch. So this is much, much, much smaller than an inch, right? And so 0.3 millimeter is the size of that pencil lead. And if you look across the very top of the pencil lead, you can count, if you can see them close enough, there's about three or so vessels that would sit on the head of that pencil lead in terms of its diameter. Right? That's, a, that's an impressively small uh, vessel, basically, for moving. When you think about it, in a summer day, a mature tree can move 100 or so gallons of water through just these tiny, tiny little vessels. And then you shrink that down even further and you think, wow, a ring, so I measure these rings to the nearest one one thousandth of a millimeter when I measure them. I don't get very many rings that are 25 millimeter. In fact, I've never had a 25 millimeter ring. I think the largest ring I've measured has been maybe six millimeters. So these are tiny, tiny rings in terms of total sort of width. And then you consider that the tree is only using two to three to four of those rings combined to move water, right? This is why when we manage trees, and especially newly planted trees, we consider watering such an important part and why you know, hitting them with your lawnmower or string trimmer or damaging any of that outer part, damaging any of that piece of ring is really detrimental, right? It's a big deal, especially on younger trees where the ring is also very narrow, right? So um, 
yeah, just kind of incredible. And then if you look to this, this picture here, I guess it would be on your right, um, this one, you can see that the lead that's the same picture, the pencil lead is right next to, and you see those two little tiny little lines? That's, that's one annual ring of growth. So that's less than 0.3 millimeter of growth, right? So that was a ring that grew in a year that happened to be a very, very dry, droughty year. Uh, trees put on wood basically a little bit differently uh, in response to varying loads. So we have, we can think about um, for hardwoods, they put on what's called reaction wood. The, the general term is reaction wood. It means they put on more wood on the side on one side or other of wherever this environmental load is. So if you think of a load of being, it's a really windy day, you've seen trees that are kind of windblown and they kind of lean over, or if it's kind of leaning off the side of a cliff or something like that, and there's a little more pressure of it going one way or the other, the tree will actually put on wood in different areas to help maintain mechanical strength. So here's what this looks like. This is a red pine. The little blue circle in the center is, is meant to represent the biological center or the pith of the tree. And you can see that wood was put on, the rings on one side are really huge. So if you looked at those rings, you'd say, wow, this tree was had a, an amazing set of years. It's great. If you looked at trees on the opposite side, if you looked at only those rings, you'd say, wow, this tree was the most miserable tree. It had no water. It was just in, in quite a state. But if you looked at kind of perpendicular to that, you would actually get a truer picture of what the uh, tree was actually growing like. Here's a picture of an elm that has kind of a similar thing. The, the center there is the, the blue, uh, is, is the biological center. And then oops, um, you can actually see this tree has a wound in it. So that's what this kind of discoloration is here in these little cracks. So where that wound originated from, I actually counted this out, that happened at about year five or six. It's a little hard to probably see um, without looking really closely, but that up until about year five or six, the rings were pretty much symmetric. That wound happened, caused some weakness within the tree, and so the tree started putting more wood on that side in order to sort of compensate for that particular injury to maintain, to stay upright, right? How smart are trees? That's pretty cool. Um, so we talked about a wound, so wood and wounds, right? So let's think about this. Unlike people, right, trees do not heal. Really, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, trees, trees don't heal at all. Um, what they do, um, the, the, the injury that, that you create or that it has been, that happened to the tree remains in the tree for life, right? So that's why, like in that picture of that little elm chunk we just saw, you could see that tree has obviously grew past that wound, but the wound was recorded in the wood. It's there forever, right? It didn't repair that wound. It grew new wood over top of it, but the actual wound is still visible within the tree. Um, the larger the wound, the larger the potential problem, okay? So the bigger the wound means that you can get disease and decay and things like that to go into the tree, and the bigger that wound is, the, the, the worse that can be for the tree. So pruning, pruning is really wounding, so every time you prune a tree, you're wounding the tree, right? It's just a kind of a, I always tell this to arborists, especially beginning arborists, this is a good way to think about it, really, because if you think, oh, every time I'm doing this, I'm, I'm kind of hurting the tree, you think, how can I hurt the tree the least, right? How can I make the wound the smallest I could possibly make it and still accomplish whatever it is I need to accomplish, right, to remove it from the house, right? We need to prune, especially in urban areas. It's a very important thing. Um, so this is, this is a tree I prune. This is my neighbor's tree. He was at work, so I, I removed this branch that was kind of encroaching on my yard. Um, no, he, he was okay with it. Um, actually, what, what I had done is I had noticed that he had, um, this tree was growing at, at a lean, and he was trying to straighten it. And so you can see just above the pruning wound, you see that little circle of indentation. He had taken a wire, he would put a dirty sock against the trunk, and taken a wire and pulled it really hard, and then staked it into the ground. This was about two weeks after he did it, and you can already see the indentation. Right, the tree was in the spring, it was growing pretty quickly, it was growing around that, and so I said, well, we'll fix this the right way, and so we pruned off a couple of things and removed some stuff. The tree was growing at a lean in order to gain access to sunlight. And so this was one year later. You can see that that wound, people say oh, it's healing over, but it's actually sealing over, right? It's not healing. That wound is still there. If we were to when we cut this tree down like a year after this, we could look at that wound. It just happened to be growing in a bad spot, but he allowed me to use it as kind of an experiment tree. Um, 
So you can see, and you see the little line above that is still visible, but it's gotten a little bit better, right? Gotten a little bit better. So here is the, this is uh, from inside of a tree, okay? So we're looking up, and you can see green at the top of that tree, right? You can see that nice green spot. Um, so trees don't heal, but they do compartmentalize. So that's me standing inside the center of that tree, right? So this is um, another redwood, basically. And this tree is still living. So remember I said that whole inside of the tree really doesn't do anything for the tree from a biological standpoint. It's there purely for structure to maintain structural integrity. Right? This happens to be in a fairly protected area, a lot of other large trees around. It's not a particularly windy area, so it's, it's managed to maintain. And that layer of cambium, with the exception of where I'm standing, was undamaged from around the tree. So it can continue to grow and support. And since it's really only using a few rings worth of, of tissue to do that anyway, um, it really doesn't need the inside as long as it can remain standing. And so the roots and the tree are still going. So the tree is basically, it can do this by compartmentalizing, which on the inside it actually creates walls, chemical walls, to prevent any disease or decay from moving into the new wood that it's laying down as it's going through. Right? tries to control that. Some trees do this better than others. Uh, oaks do this fairly well. Things that are decay resistant like honey locust uh, um, happen to do this fairly well. Other trees um, like box elder or some of the others don't do this particularly well. Um, and that's why they tend to be a lot of disease and decay problems with those trees. So wounds last. So here we see another, this is a, a chunk of processed wood that a friend of mine gave me. Um, you can see uh, that, that where I've circled there, there's a little bit of a, an interesting wound and I actually counted the rings after this. this. I only had this chunk, I didn't have the whole tree to look at, but at least after this particular wound, there was about another seven or eight years of growth. Okay, And then we, um, it's kind of an interesting sample. Uh, if you can see that, it's actually, it's a bullet. Somebody shot this tree. I don't know if it was trespassing um, or what the problem with this tree was, but the tree was shot. Um, it actually survived for another eight years with a bullet lodged inside of it. And you can see this must have, I'm guessing this probably happened sometime in the spring. The reason I say that is the bullet head is not mushroomed at all, right? It's pretty, it's basically fully intact. And in the spring, the wood is a little bit softer as water starts to flow. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was uh, damage. This is actually black walnut, so reasonably hard wood. Um, and you can see where the, the bullet tore through the wood, and you still see those torn wood fibers and vessels, right? The tear is still there, right? Eight years later, that's no healing that has happened. You can see that new tissue grew around that and eventually, after a year or two, sealed over so that wound was no longer visible. Just as a point of sort of irony, this piece of wood was destined for a gunstock handle of a rifle. Um, and when they cut through it, um, they found the bullet, obviously, and they said, well, we can't use this. I think it would have been kind of a cool rifle gun stock, right? Um, but yeah, so that, that's where this particular sample came from. So wood production. So photosynthesis, really, this is, this is where this all happens. And photosynthesis is incredibly complicated, right? It's very, very, even physicists a lot of times have a difficult time understanding exactly how this process works. But essentially it takes the inputs of sunlight, that's the free energy. This is how trees can be primary producers, right? They can produce their own energy because they're getting free energy from the sunlight. The sunlight basically takes the inputs of of water and it rips apart hydrogen and oxygen, which is a very energetic thing, and it shoots some electrons out, right? Those electrons kind of go through this chain and through that basically um, it takes, as it's taking in the CO2 from the atmosphere, it's basically converting that into sugars that, that, the, um, that the tree can then use to build its body, which is why the tree is mostly carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? Those are its major inputs, basically. This formula basically shows you carbon dioxide and water, and then you get glu glucose, which is sugar, and then you get oxygen, right? So we get oxygen kicked back out into the atmosphere. Um, this is overly simplified. The, the carbon, the glucose molecule that comes out of there is really much more complicated than that, but it kind of gives you a, a good sense of, of what that looks like. So photosynthesis, the reason leaves are green is because of the, the um, wavelengths of light. So photosynthesis doesn't use green light almost at all. It uses red light and it uses blue light. And the light that it's not using is the light that it's reflecting back to you, which is green. Right? And so the primary chemicals, chlorophyll, 
chlorophyll of A and B use primarily red and blue light. And in fact, you can distill chlorophyll into a jar and you can shine a light on it. And you can actually see this happening in, in sort of real time. Um, if anybody is interested in how you do that, you can ask me at the end. It's kind of a fun little experiment. So here we have um, in the, the sort of upper corner there with the Fe in the center, that's iron. So this is, I just think this is so cool. This is hemoglobin, right? The stuff that's in your blood, basically, that helps carry oxygen to your muscles, to your body, and then takes carbon dioxide and throws it back into your lungs. And then this molecule with this longer tail that's kind of off to the side where it has Mg, that's magnesium, that's in the center, that's a chlorophyll molecule. And I just think this is kind of interesting. Look at how well these two align. Not quite identical, but very, very similar, right? So you're like, I don't know, a second cousin twice removed from trees, um, chemically anyway. So yeah, hemoglobin and chlorophyll, very, very similar to each other and sort of, uh, even in almost what they do, they both work with oxygen, they both work with carbon and carbon dioxide, so really sort of an interesting thing. Um, so I talked a little bit about stomata and about what those do. So this is a really close up. So I had a cartoon picture of this before, but this is actually a close up picture of stomata. So it's this kind of um, um, whiter uh, protruding part here at, at, the, at the bottom of the picture, right? And so this is actually the stomata from a tomato leaf that just happens to be what the website had the sort of best, clearest picture of. And stomata, basically, this sort of ring around the top, that's actually where uh, those, that's called the guard cells, that, those will actually open and close in response to how much water is in the tree. When the tree is full of water, it's like a, a flattened bicycle tire, right? When it's full of water, it's like a bicycle tire full of air. It forms a circle, and it opens that stomata, which allows more uh, oxygen out and more carbon dioxide in. That's where uh, carbon dioxide comes is in, through the stomata. And obviously, the leaves are where photosynthesis is happening. When it runs out of water, like an, a bicycle tire that has no air in it, kind of flattens shut, right? That, that center hole is no longer there. So the stomata regulates water in this, in this sense. So has anybody gone to a, a nursery or garden center or something and said, somebody tried to sell you tree food or plant food? Anybody had that happen? Yeah, I see some head shaking. Um, so that's actually uh, not what you're buying. You're buying more closer to vitamins. Um, if you want to feed your tree, in fact, if, if anybody sells you a service, I'm going to feed your tree for you, um, what you should expect them to do is come and stand by your tree and just exhale for hours, <laughs> right? That would actually be feeding your tree if they're putting fertilizer down at the base of your tree, they're more giving it uh, nutrients like vitamins and things like that. So every time, so if you're out running around and you're jogging, right, you've eaten food, your body has now processed those sugars, you are absorbed some of that carbon to maintain your body, some of that you don't. And as you exhale, you're exhaling some of the carbon from the food you ate. As you exhale that near a tree, the tree is absorbing some of that carbon that was in you, that was in some other piece of food at some other point, and is now in that tree. So now if you think back to the tree that's 4,800 plus years old, anybody that was breathing by that tree 4,800 plus years ago, part of their, the, mo the carbon molecules that were in their body are now inside that tree, right? Kind of held there. So every time you're exhaling, you're leaving a little bit of yourself in the tree as you go, right? So just to help you remember that, this is the mouth of the tree, right? This is where the tree eats. The tree does not eat through the roots. It drinks through the roots, but it eats through the leaves. Okay, so now, now you know. Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave you with this thought, and then we, we have time for questions, I think. So, you know, trees are really just, they're dynamic, they're dynamic systems that change through time, and they've evolved, and obviously some have been here for quite a long time, and so they have to be able to withstand that, whatever's happening in their environment, because they cannot escape it. And so, yeah, they're just really um, amazing sort of organisms and systems. Um, and here's my contact information website if people have questions. I always like to get questions. If you have interesting photographs, I love I incorporate people's photographs. If you give me permission, I'd love to do it. So uh, with that, if anybody has questions, I would be happy to, uh, to answer. Yeah. When it's running or when we're extracting it? Yeah. 
either. <laughs> so um, in, the, in the spring, right, before the leaves have fully emerged, the tree is, is starting to sort of come back alive, right? So in the, in the winter season, the tree goes dormant. It stops all of its metabolic activity. When the temperatures get warm enough, it starts kind of waking back up. It needs to move water back into its cells. And then the sap starts to flow basically from the storage inside the root system up into the tree that takes all those sugars so that it can help build the leaves. Basically, it needs energy to build and expand those leaves. So at, that's what's happening. All trees do this, right? Maple just happened to make a, a really tasty sap that we have exploited. And if you've ever had sap directly from a maple tree, it's not that, it's, it is sweet. You can taste a little bit of sweetness, but basically uh, I think the average component is something like a 40 to one so if you have about one gallon of maple, or you want one gallon of syrup, it takes about 40 gallons of sap on average. It depends upon how much sugar content there is and how much sugar, how sugar you want it to be. Um, yeah. So earlier you mentioned that um, trees, that there were some trees that were 4,000, 5,000, 9,000 years old. Yeah. How, how is that determined? So the, the age of the, the 4,000 year old tree, so the, the bristol cone pine, where you have a single trunk, they actually take, um, they do it one of two ways. If it's still a living tree, they use a, a, an instrument called an increment bore. And it's basically a metal shaft with a handle. And on the very end of the shaft are, are threads like you would have on a screw and then that shaft is completely hollow. And then you walk up to the tree and you, and you turn. <laughs> and depending upon how, how thick the tree is, it takes anywhere from five minutes to about an hour to get in. And then you extract that core out. There's a little extractor in there. You extract that out. Um, and you take that back and you can then cut it uh, or kind of shave off the top of it so you get a really nice polished surface. And then you can either count, you can count the rings essentially. Yeah. On, on the 9,000 plus year old tree, um, the one where it's essentially a clonal system and the above, there's no one single piece that's probably 9,000 years old. Um, I've never heard exactly how they've determined that, but I'm guessing it's with some uh, radioisotopes and basically looking at either genetic structure or looking at some pieces of it that, that still hold isotopic signatures yeah. instead of using rings, for instance. Um, I have some forestry land, and I plant some uh, walnut and oak every year. Yeah. And uh, if I if I take some um, nuts from a walnut tree and just scatter them around my land, and sometimes I push them into the ground, you know, I just do this uh, occasionally. Will they grow? Uh, if I just push them into the ground a short ways, or sometimes I just somebody told me if you just leave them on top, just throw them, and they'll grow. I yeah. Know. I mean, if you look at the walnuts that have been planted in my so I live in Minneapolis in a, in a so fairly urban area, and all the walnuts that are growing there were planted by squirrels. So if you've ever watched squirrels with walnuts, they dig a little hole, they drop the walnut in, right, and then they forget about it, um, and then a tree grows, but not every time. So um, a botany professor I had said basically, uh, so a walnut is a seed, right, and a seed is just a, a baby plant uh, in, a, in a little box with its lunch, right? And so if, if the conditions are right, the, the tree can grow. So one, it, it assumes that the seed is fully formed, right? So you can have seeds. So maples put out a, a ton of seed, right? Especially silver maples, box elder. A lot of those seeds, if you go to plant them, they just don't work, right? And it's because the maple is hedging its bets. It's saying, you know what? I'm not going to spend a lot of time making these, but I'm going to make a lot of them and eventually a bunch of them will plant. The walnut is probably, the, I, I don't know specifically on walnut, but if you look at, if you do a Google search for North American Silvix um, manual, you can find, it'll tell you basically the germination rate of various trees that, that exist in, for North American species, uh, species. And black walnut would have some rate. I know for things like Kentucky coffee tree, uh, which has a really hard seed, if you, plant that out, it's got about a 90% germination rate, or excuse me, 90% growth rate assuming it germinates. Part of the problem is getting it germinating, which the germination is basically the seed has to get enough moisture in it and stay moist. Just like if you're starting a little garden and you, you put little carrot seeds or whatever and little things you keep all the soil or whatever you've got them on really moist, tree seeds are no different than that. They need to germinate and so that requires that the seed is healthy when it was planted, and then it requires that it has enough moisture. So it is possible, probably not all of them, um, but it's possible that, that some would go, sure. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's again, that's a little bit species dependent. So sugar maple would actually grow under this, the shade of others. Um, uh, things like black walnut, actually, it has a, a, a thing in its roots called juglans, the chemical that it exudes, and it's called an alleliopathic chemical, and that basically means it inhibits growth. So you've got two things going against you there. It's not really a shade tolerant tree, and then it's got some chemicals there inhibiting growth. Yeah. You uh, mentioned, I think it was Denmark, that this tree grew up. Yeah, yeah. The, uh -huh. It sounded like the, the growing season uh, increased. Yep. Do you, is there other work that you can do in terms of studying trees that can give you evidence for climate change? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, they, they've, so dendrochronology uses tree rings to determine climate factors all over, uh, mostly in, in the sort of northern hemisphere. And the reason for that is, or one of the reasons for that, is that trees in the tropics don't put on annual rings. So they don't, they're not controlled by seasons like we are here in Minnesota. So you really need trees that are growing in this temperate region that actually have a, a strict dormant season every year. And then you can figure out the annual growth. So yes, they, they have looked at tree rings to look at climate, a lot of drought types of things to looking at major droughts. It works really well in places where water or moisture is the limiting factor. So arid southwest of the US, which is where a lot of dendrochronology sort of started from, or actually not sort of did start from. And that's where they have done a lot of work in terms of looking at and comparing tree growth to droughts. And then they can do what's called extending a chronology backward in time. And what they do is they take a living tree and they take known measurements of moisture and they take that living tree ring and they measure out each individual ring, they form a pattern and they say, oh, this correlates well with when it was droughty. And then they, they look at before we had climate records and they, they find the same patterns and the assumption is then that those patterns are also reflecting drought. And so then what they can do is they can take tree rings that overlap a little bit by a few years and they can extend these chronologies back in time. I think the oldest chronology that I'm aware of is around 10,000 years old. And it's not from a single tree. It's a composite of many different trees that have overlapping rings and they can kind of measure back. So about 10,000 years is, is what we're looking at. Yeah. One more. With the treatment for ash trees, what is that, you know, the liquid treatment, what is that really doing to the tree and is it proven successful? Yeah, so there are a couple of different treatments. Uh, both of the two that I'm aware of are successful. It, in terms of doing anything to the tree, I don't, I don't think I've seen any studies that have said it, it negatively impacts the tree at all. Typically, those are injected into the tree. And what that chemical does for emerald ash borer is that actually it, it's essentially an insecticide. So it, it kills the larval state of the bug because the larval state is the state that we really care about um, in terms of it kills, actually it kills both. Um, the flying insects and the, and the larval state to basically keep uh, populations down. So it's effective as long as the tree doesn't have too many in it, right? If it has a lot of EAB already in it, then it's not as effective, or, or it's really not effective at all. Uh, but in terms of, it doesn't really damage the tree if that's the, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So am I, I'm pulling, all right. The highlight of the evening. The highlight of the evening. All right. I'll mix it up. I don't want anybody in the bottom to not have a fair shake. <laughs> That's right. All right. All right. Oh, Ginny Wong. Ginny Wong. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. There you go, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome.